We're getting back on track here with Catherine and Emily, but as you know, we won't stay there for long because this is the Going Off Track podcast. Hello, hello, and welcome back to the Going Off Track podcast. I'm Catherine, that's Emily, and we survived Monaco? Not all of us. Majority. No. No, not everyone. A, a third of the, a quarter of the grid did not, but we kind of technically we 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 watched the whole race. We got to the point where the end of the race, and we're still awake in despite all odds. Yes, still alive, barely breathing. Um, but no, I I mean, not to like jump into it, jump into it, but I. And I thoroughly had a good day today. I thoroughly enjoyed my time watching it. I was, you know, gifted a nice red flag to go run and get a coffee because I am currently yes. Sans coffee maker, um, which was so lovely. Nice surprise. I did wake up late and I missed my coffee window, which, oop, thanks for the red flag, Hoss. Um, they're just supporters of coffee mornings, you know? Gotta Cle- clearly. Gotta love them. But no, I, I had a, a good time. I enjoyed it. I always loved it. Um, laps three through 76 were boring as hell. And then it got better, um, yeah, which yeah. is is fine. It, you know, and we'll, we'll, we'll talk a little bit more in depth about all of the things. But the, the whole point of, of point A to point B is, is and this is something that they, they were talking about in a couple of the post-race shows that I was watching is this is not a race where people are going to go and watch clips of and go back and re-watch and, and you know really the only memorialization is who won that race and congratulations to Charles Leclerc for finally beating the Monaco curse and winning at home for the first time in like six tries. Yeah, when I saw the stat flash on the screen this morning, I was like, "Ooh, it's it's so much worse when you actually put it up there." But now, you right. know, he ha- he converted his pole, which is really exciting, and hopefully, you know, there's more more good fortune for him in Monaco. It's always nice to see, you know, the hometown hero or the hometown person win. So, I'm happy for him. I wish it would have been Charles, but or uh, Carlos, not Charles. But um, I did see like a snip of an interview of Carlos saying, like, "Well, of course I want to win, but in order for me to win, something has to go really wrong with the team because it's Monaco." And he's like, "And I don't wish that on the team," which I thought was very, you know, teammatey of him, even though things at Ferrari have not necessarily been teammatey for him this season. So, yeah, I mean. Act. Yeah, he he really is. But fortunately, he also compared to the last few weeks has had a had, he had a good weekend. Um, but before we get into the race itself and and breaking down everything, we have a little bit of of pre weekend stuff um, to discuss. And and this is something that I'm very passionate about is Formula One social media. I feel is some of the best social media accounts and management in all of sports. Yeah. And uh, they ran away with a really, really fun little gimmick this weekend um, in which Oscar Piastri, um, who he really wants to have like some sort of personal tie to every single Formula One race on the calendar um, and has basically been adopted by Charles Leclerc and is now a member of the Leclerc family to the point where in the social graphics uh, for who finished in in what place in FP1, they put Oscar Piastri Leclerc. Yeah. And like everyone bought into it. ESPN did at the F, you know, F1. um, I think the Miami Grand Prix account like posted something as well. Yeah. Um, But I love when something just, little and funny gets blown up and everyone buys into it everyone you know jumps on the bandwagon even Oscar's mom um jumped in who she's just so much fun to watch on social media um she has great sense of humor I love everything that she does during races she she does not go to a lot of races no she doesn't super super anxious and like stressed and she doesn't like it um, but yeah, I think she was reaching out to Yuki saying like, Hey, Yuki, it looks like yes. I'm Donna's son, like if you're interested and like, I love how everyone just played into it. It made the weekend really funny and fun. Just seeing like what people were going to do. 
Um, again, something so small, but just provides extra, you know, entertainment off track. Yeah, I like, and I, you know, I saw McLaren get into it, Ferrari get into it, which like, that makes sense. Like those social media admins, like that's what they do. But when the Formula One Instagram account gets involved and like, that's the one where you like kind of expect it to be like a little bit above it all. Like maybe they'll like slide into a comment under an Instagram post and say something funny in agreement or whatever, but they were actually going ahead and making the graphics and changing the names um, and, do- and doing all of that, which I thought was really great and really, you know, keeps, you know, the sport in touch with what people are, are think, you know, think is entertaining and funny outside of, you know, what we traditionally see on social media. So I really appreciated that. And that was a uh, really fun through like through the entire weekend. Yeah. And I think something that we forget is that, like, everyone on tra- well, I don't want to say everyone, most of the drivers on track have a wonderful personality and are full of jokes. And they're all relatively the same age. We do have, you know, Alonzo and... Old Hamilton, man Fernando. Who are, little, who are a little older. But majority of them are around the same age they've grown up karting together they've grown up racing together they're all I would say semi-friendly um which leads to more of this back and forth between the drivers and I think when the drivers really take on and and latch on to something happening on social media that's when it really just kind of like goes and snowballs if you will yeah exactly like I said in Miami like I don't think Formula One has ever been at a point where all of the drivers, um, teammates, and especially not as teammates, are such good friends. Like, obviously, they leave it inside on the track, but I don't think that we really see typically, I, I don't think it's typical that we have this the same sense of camaraderie where, you know, Carlos says that he doesn't want anything that's going to put him in the position to win Monaco because it means something tragic's happened to, to Charles and look how many times something tragic has happened to Charles in, you know, at the Monaco Grand Prix. Um, and, you know, I, I think that that's, another really great thing that we have in this sport in this current era um, that I really like and really appreciate. And obviously we love to have these great rivalries and we've had plenty of great rivalries and we have, we continue to have some, some great rivalries. Um, Kevin Magnuson versus everything. Um, (laughs) Esteban Ocon versus his teammate. Um, But it's, it's great that we, you know, it's great that we get to have both. Yeah, no, 100%. And it makes it fun for the weekends, too, just to, like, see what's going to happen. So we always love off, yeah. off-track off entertainment. Um, speaking of another off-track thing we like to keep in touch with, the fashion. So yes. everyone knows that I, and Catherine as well, love the fashion of F1. I'd say a few years ago, everyone was like, at the top of their game, bringing it every single weekend. Oh, yeah. And I know it's not something we talk about a lot, but we do in our DMs. But Lewis Hamilton is, like, carrying the entire grid on his back. And it, I think, he, one, he's just a very fashionable, stylish person in general. But he pulls off anything. Like, anything you throw at him, he can pull off. And all weekend, he's showing up on a boat, looking awesome. And then you have, like, Lance Stroll showing up with his, like, crazy you know floofy hair and a freaking polo and it's like come on guys guys even like Lando Norris wasn't in team gear but he rolled up one of the days in like a giant oversized hoodie and sweats and I'm like yes those are probably like designer hoodies and designer sweatpants but come on give us give us something like Lewis Hamilton comes off a yacht wearing this like open necked belly button cut fuzzy purple sweater and it looked awesome. Yeah, it like abs- it like like what that's what we want more of. That's what we expected to see more of. And I know that like typically Ferrari like they tr- they traditionally come in team gear and the Red Bull guys come in team gear like whatever. Like the f- the fashion that we expected out of the more fashionable drivers, we have not been getting this year and I think that's been really disappointing. And it's like we have Miami and we had Monaco and like that's when you like those are big awesome bring it races and I'm just a little disappointed so I just needed to voice my opinion there but yeah and even I, the I gridlock agree. like it wasn't that exciting 
No, the though we did. Wise. We did. Fashion wise, it was okay. We did get to see Michael Douglas, who was always happy to talk to Martin Brundle, and it's like my favorite thing. And I think Netflix needs to like sneak him a few dollars for his free marketing for Wednesday. Oh my gosh. Um, I love that he was promoting Catherine Zeta Jones's. She's like, she's not here, Martin, but she wanted me to make sure that I said hello to you right now. She's yeah. currently filming season two of Wednesday, <laughs> Wednesday. coming out on Netflix. <laughs> Oh, classic. I mean, he's been in the business for so long. He knows how to do this, but um, yeah. Yeah. And I, one of my really good friends who doesn't normally watch F1, but like was watching because it's Monaco again, because it's Monaco. Right. Um, He's like, this guy, whoever he is, is running after people and interrupting them. And just like, I'm like, yeah, that's Martin. That's Martin for you. That's what he does. Great. When he was trying to talk to the footballer and he was like, um, no, I'm sorry. I'm in the queue here. Like the cheese shop. I'm in the queue. <laughs> you will not. Do you speak English? Is this an English telecast? No. Then you need to wait. And I was just like, oh yeah. my God. I love he, he said something. He's like, it's okay. I'm in charge here. And I was like, I love Martin so much. It was, it was, it was, I, he, so he hadn't, we, we didn't have a grid walk in Imola because he wasn't in Imola. Um, I missed it. Like I'm like the grid walk is sometimes like very stressful and a little cringe, but I I, I didn't mind it. And when when Killian Mbappe was like, I'm just here as a fan, and then you see him waving the checkered flag at the end of the race, I'm like, no, you are not here as a fan. You talk to freaking Martin for two gosh damn seconds. Which of course, as as we have, have said, if you're on the grid, you are at risk of being approached by Martin Brundle for the grid walk, and you just have to learn to live with it. Like, like give him Ola give him a two MGK second sound bite. In Brazil. <laughs> Which was MGK in Brazil, but like, just just speak to the man for two goddamn seconds. Like, if, if like, I know that these people don't really know a lot about Formula One and they just get invited to things, but like, come on, like, oh. so, who, whoever invites him just needs to like prep them and be like, Martin Brundle, he's real, he exists, he will ask you questions. Just give him a two second line. Um, another thing that we had um, is. And we talked about one of them because they had released one. And then immediately, like, after we finished recording, like, four more Always. helmets got dropped, which Always. is, of course, how it happens. Um, but we talked in the predictions episode about Oscar Piastri and how he had a little bit more of, like, a, a modernized um, Senna tribute helmet. And then Lando Norris released his Senna tribute helmet. And Love. I loved it. I did, too. I don't, I mean, I don't, I truly do not think... Lando has dropped a helmet that I've been like, no. Some of them are no. like, oh, you know, that, that's a cool helmet. Some of them, like his normal helmet for this season, I'm obsessed with. And I'm like, yes, that's a cool helmet. Um, but Lando does a really, really good job with his specialty helmets, with his normal helmets. I I really think that he's, you know, done a good job. And maybe he has nothing to do with it, which is why they're so good. Because I feel like sometimes if people are maybe have – too many ideas it gets a little crazy um but I've always loved his helmet oh I I think it was it was a great play on the helmet that he uses in normal races but then also giving it a little bit of touch of Senna so I thought that that was really cool um then Charles Leclerc he also had a Monaco helmet that I didn't notice until he got out of the car at the end of the race but that is that was a me thing. Nico Hulkenberg wore his Monaco helmet for all of five minutes today. Um, and I actually really liked his. It was also one of those like tribute to, you know, his, you know, home. Um, and then Valtteri Botas, I thought his was pretty cool. He had the blue Mediterranean Sea helmet, um, which uh, is going to be signed by him and Prince Albert of Monaco and then auctioned off um, on September 25th at the Blue Marine auction. Um, and it was also designed by his partner, um, Australian cyclist Tiffany Cromwell. So I thought it was really cool. Yeah. I think it's really cool how much Valtteri Botas like gives back. Yeah. Like he does a lot for a lot of people. And I think not everyone realizes that, but like his weird ass calendar, literally, pun intended. Yeah. Um, that was for charity. He does this. He did like something with his mullet last year for something. So I think November. It's cool. Yeah. And so he does a bunch of stuff, um, which I think is really cool that you can do that through your helmet. So good for him. Yeah, with, I think this this was actually a good a good re- weekend for helmets. I think you know last last week in Emila was a little 
quiet. Um, but this this was this was a good week for for the for the custom helmets. Um, and that brings us to actually what the helmets are used for, which is protecting driver noggins during the race. Um, and why would you need a helmet, Catherine? Nothing I have no idea. I mean, they didn't have helmets in 19, or like real helmets in 1950. They had, you know, real men leather head covers. <laughs> sure. Um, but I thought it was really cool. Like the Monaco Grand Prix has existed for, you know, longer than Formula One has been a sport. The first Monaco Grand Prix was in 1929. The first Formula One season was 1950. Um, there has never been a Monegasque driver to win in Monaco until today, in 2024. Um, and I think that's, that's a really cool part of what Leclerc was able to do today. Yeah, it was. And I'm not going to lie. I didn't cry, but I definitely got misty eyed. Just like I did too. Realizing the, the gravity of this race of him winning. Monaco is such a small country. What, principality. Principality. However, yeah. However it's defined. So for some, you know, a very, very small community to have a driver win this you know the jewel in the crown that they've been calling it all you know forever um it's a really big deal and I don't know I he's not my favorite Ferrari driver but I was very very happy for him this weekend yeah I I agree he's he's definitely not not my favorite um but can you like how can you not appreciate when he calls in on on the radio on lap 76 and says I'm gonna bring it home and then you hear in the cool down room after that the next lap he started crying in the car and he's like I can't cry right now I need to be able to see so I can finish this race um so it, you know it, it was a really emotional thing for him he lost his father young um and you know he he always you know wanted to win his home race and then like coming through on those last couple of turns and all the boats are honking for him in the harbor um and then everybody like everybody loved that well I think it's you know they were kind of talking about this but it's a huge full circle full circle moment for him because he said growing up here watching this race this is what made me want to be an f1 driver right so you know it's it's a big it's a big thing it's super exciting and and everyone wants to win Monaco also yeah on that note super randomly but they did like a little in entry video with uh, Hans and Button and he said like yeah you want to be world champion but you also just really want to win Monaco which right. proves my point that this is a great race and we should always make exceptions for Monaco yes. This year was a little bit different. We'll go into a little bit more of like our thoughts on this year's race versus the the Monaco thing later on. Um, but I so this this race was very nice and meaningful for for Leclerc. It was not my favorite race, probably that I've ever watched. But I will say that my absolute highlight of the day, Prince Albert of Monaco. Oh my gosh, we just need to take a beat because. This man was crying. He was singing the anthem. He was spraying champagne. He was chugging champagne. And, like, he's a crown prince. And, yeah. He broke all the royal protocol. What <laughs> what I love is, like, when in Monaco, one of the things that, that the drivers are prepared on as they go to the podium is do not spray Prince Albert of Monaco with champagne after the anthems are done. Like, like they 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 specifically have somebody who warns them. Um, Albert and Princess Charlene, they like make sure to clear the heck off the the stage, you know. And then this time, I was like, I wonder if they're gonna give Prince Albert a bottle of champagne to celebrate with and then all of a sudden he just comes in from the back with the bottle and starts spraying all all four of them on on the podium and I'm like this is one of the best things I've ever seen the only thing that would have eclipsed that is if he did like a Lando just like champagne <laughs> bong and was just like everywhere um I thought it was really cool and it had to have been super meaningful to Charles where like he gave him a really big hug on the podium oh yeah like he was crying um again just a really big deal for a monogasque to to bring home the the trophy so yeah definitely a big exciting moment for for national pride there's a little kid on the end of the podium who was just like bopping along to the anthem oh my gosh I know Um, yeah it was great of another monogasque now um, Oscar <laughs> yeah. um, I am super happy for him. 
super, you know, young driver, only a second Monaco Grand Prix, did get P2, so held on to that. Um, I think he had a great weekend. I think he's really, you know, developing. I think the upgrades to McLaren have really helped them out. I loved seeing Ferrari and McLaren at the top and like no no Mercedes, no Red Bull. I really enjoyed that. I, we both had uh, Land or we both had Oscar. Oscar on our podium. So, you know, we had a good feeling about it, mostly because he qualifies really well and it's really hard to overtake. This is what the first time that like the for uh top 10 have not the whole changed. top 10 yeah. yeah so top 10 starting grid ended as the top 10 you know final pl- um places which is the first time that's ever happened which just goes to show you how hard it is to overtake in monaco but really happy for oscar i think he it was well deserved um even and he had damage uh, too he had damage yeah from from turn one <laughs> from yeah. carlos so Um, I think he did really well. My only, like, gripe with McLaren this weekend is their commitment to this whole Senna thing. I get it. Senna's the most winningest driver. We've moved on from that. We said, hey, let's make our drivers look like Sprite. They did that very well. They did, yes. But then, like, half of the garage was in the McLaren orange. And it's like, I get it. It's only one weekend, only one race. We're not going to, like, go all in. But we've argued about this back and forth. If you're going to do something, go all in. I hated how half the garage was still in McLaren orange and half was in like the Senna stuff. It just, it ruined it for me. Yeah, it's like when we had the yellow Ferrari, everyone was in yellow Ferrari gear. Um, so I, I see your point. I did notice that. I was like, oh, that's that's not a Sprite bottle with arms. Um, that's a, that's just a McLaren mechanic. So yeah, I, there there have been other teams who have been a little bit more committed to more than just the most front facing people, aka the drivers. Um, so it's it's fair to to, to nitpick a little. Um, but let's also talk about our boy Carlos. Oh, our boy Carlos got so, so lucky. Yeah. <laughs> So, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Whew. Um, yeah, this is probably peak anxiety for Emily of the weekend. Yeah, uh, he got a puncture and it's like, well, he's out and, you know, it qualified well. It is what it is. And then K-Mags did K-Mags things and yeah. ruined the day for him and his teammate Hulk and Sergio Perez. And Carlos, I don't know how he got so lucky, but. Not all the cars made it through to the second sector, which means if they don't have a timed sector, they can't necessarily technically set be a new placed. grid or be placed. So because the accident red flagged the race, they went back to the starting grid because that's the last like timed place that they had, which means Carlos got a free pass and he got to be back in P3. He held on to P3. He finished on the podium, first podium since Japan. Holy hell. Yeah, it, and, and like the damage, like when you watch the replay, it really doesn't look like there was a lot of contact between no. him and Piastri. Like, and for like, I, I remember late, later on, they were saying that during the red flag, they replaced one of Oscar's whole side pods. Mm-hmm. Um, And, but, and Carlos, he just, he just had a puncture, very little damage to the actual car. And they were talking in the cool down room and they're like, I don't, I didn't even feel it when we, when our cars touched, like nobody had, like, I don't know how the cars decided to be so delicate in that moment to give, you know, enough damage to both of them to be noticeable. And then Carlos just got so lucky with, you know, when they just, you know, when the, words Catherine when race direction decided to to put the the count back to the original starting grid barring you know everybody else who had you know and you know ended Ended their their race (laughs) after after half of a turn well I think that Oscar also got super lucky because if he did truly have damage to the side pod like I don't think he could have stayed in p2 no, they they managed to to replace the side pod and then kind of fix as much of the floor as possible, um, yeah. and he just kind of had to live with it. And they, they that's why they said on the radio like 
I, I don't even remember what they said, but what what they ended up saying in a nutshell was that it's not going to like the damage to the car is not going to cause, you know, problems with holding position, which he managed to hold position, you know, against Carlos, who I think, you know, Carlos on any other track would have been able to easily overtake him. Oh, 100 percent. I think Carlos drove really well and he drove for the team today. Like, oh, yeah. himself. Yeah, it was it was a team drive for him. It was also a team drive for Lando, um, and you know the, those top four drivers really they were playing the team game. They were making sure that they were you know hold, you know maintaining those tires and you know driving a really slow, really boring race that was Speaking safe. Playing a team game, um, I got the feeling that like George all day today was like. I'm just going to be my own team and I'm going to tell the team what to do. Like he was race direction and chief strategist and driver and like probably mechanic if he needed to for Mercedes. Like his radio calls were killing me. I just think radio calls in general this weekend were yeah. so good. I I just, I first of all, speaking of radio calls, I think that Charles's banter with his new um, <laughs> race engineer, Brian, was great. Is like, you you don't want to know this that's rude i thought that was great but going going back to george i th- i don't know what the hell george was doing because yes george was on mediums which was a, a gamble that george and max and lewis all took after the red flag um but i i don't know what who he was driving to support other than for some reason driving to support Lando Norris because he was managing his tires for so long and pulling pushing the rest of the grid back so far it was very much like um Fernando Alonso in 2022 where he had everyone behind him a full half lap but like the only thing that that was benefiting was Lando and and giving Lando the opportunity to have a free pit stop that Lando did not end up taking which I think was was to you know the benefit of Lando but I just don't understand why George did that well no and Verstappen was right behind him and he's like why is he driving so slow like all he's all he's doing is giving them a free pit window like this is so dumb um yeah Max just wanted to take a nap. Yeah. Oh my Max gosh. was bored. I the was radio, bored. The radio was so funny. And like, what was it on Friday? I think it was Friday. Every single radio call was, I've hit the wall. I've hit the wall. Yeah. I've hit the wall. <laughs> I've hit the wall. <laughs> oh, so good. Yeah. And it was, and even then, like, I think Logan's Logan hit the wall and, and I was like, oh, is something exciting going to happen? And then, oh, Lance Stroll lost a tire but of course he lost a tire in In the the pit pit lane lane. so nothing happened and and like it was it was at a point i think in like the the 50s uh lap count and i was just like can something please happen i'm so bored i have been awake since five o'clock this morning because last year we had weather yes which like threw everything off and this i mean it was a beautiful day um lap not even finishing lap one the first three, three turns. The first three turns were super exciting. And it's like, okay, we're going to have a good race. And then it just kind of flatlined there. But I still yeah. think the fact that Charles won is, you know, exciting. And he drove It well. made up for it. Yeah. yeah. It, it, was, it was a flawly ex, flawlessly executed race. Um, also did a, did a good job executing um, Yuki Sonoda, who, he, yes, was driving in literal no man's land but has now scored points in the last three races and five of the last six and has been driving really well. No, he is doing super well. I will say this until I'm blue in the face. I want to see him in a better car. I really do. Like, we know he's not going to get a Red Bull seat, which is fine. But then, like, I want to see – I want to see him at Aston Martin when Honda moves. I really, really do. And I think he – is just going to continue to impress. He's still pretty early on in his career. He's doing really well. And yeah, I'm I'm really impressed with him. I'm I've always been team Yuki, but now I'm like really getting on the bandwagon. 
Yeah, and he had Alex Albon behind him basically the entire race. And those two cars, and like the back of the grid proved that you can overtake in Monaco. There were overtakes in, in Monaco. It was not exciting overtaking. There I think like I, five, I, Catherine. No, no, no. I, I know that there were not a large number of them, but the fact of the matter is it is still possible to overtake in Monaco. Is it easy to overtake in Monaco? No. no. Were people not overtaking in Monaco because everybody was tire man? management managing yes um but he managed to keep you know alex behind him the entire time um and is you know he is single-handedly willing v carb up the you know up into the lower midfield which is exactly what i said last week yeah oh speaking of alex alban williams has a point yes finally they have two points (laughs) Go team. <laughs> yes. Um, super exciting. I we've always been, you know, fans of Alex and we've been even bigger fans of James Vowles. And yes. I would just like to, you know, take a beat from our normal um uh words, Emily, from our normal line of, you know, whatever speaking. <laughs> la, 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 la. Also, I have like literally zero sleep under my belt and I don't have a coffee machine so I am just really struggling you're, to survive you're right doing now. great you I were doing not doing well right um but no kind of taking a step away from just talking about the race and the drivers James Valls continues to impress me every single weekend he gets on the team principal broadcast oh 100 I cannot put into words or stress this enough how much I love him talking to us he's so open he's very direct he can take like crazy strategy and crazy engineering concepts and dumb them down for, you know, the peasants like us. And it is so refreshing to hear someone talk, you know, truly about the question and not like skirt it and be a douche a la Zach Brown. But yeah. I, and just the horrible monotone of Bradley. But I wish we could have James Vowles commentate every single week. Everything. Everything. Yeah. I yeah. would listen to I him hope, read the dictionary. I hope, and this is like a very long time out, like in in 20 years, I hope that James Vows, when he decides to move on from being a team principal, decides to join commentary. Because I would kill for if James Vows to do commentary. Sports, I don't know what I'll do with myself. Like, right. honestly. Oh, yeah. He's just so good. And he explains it. And he thoroughly answers the question. And he takes time. I just love it. It's great. Yeah. His 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 commentary is is great. It's very detailed, but like in a way that's like, "Oh, I understand what's happening here," which I he think is fantastic. You. Yeah, it's it's so great. And it's I really hope that we get more James Wild content and Drive to Survive for the 2024 season cuz I really yes, think what he's doing at Williams is exciting and I just I think he's great. Yeah. He I wholeheartedly agree. I love the joke um, he made too about Lewis. Yes, that was really good. Yeah. He, you know, he has a he has a sense of humor. Yeah, I mean, he he's a like not even a secret troll. I remember, you know, in the off season, right after he joined Instagram, um he did this video where he's like, "Yeah, you know, I'm going to give you a sneak preview of the car. Oh, wait, I'm sorry. Um my phone, the service is bad and like the video cuts off." And I'm like, n- like nobody expected James vows of all people in Formula One of all team principals to come onto social media and just be like a world class troll. No, never. It's great. Years. I just I love that he has personality and he like shows it because sometimes when he talks, it's like this guy. There's still way he has a sense of humor, and then he just like cracks a joke, and I'm just like, yes, James. Yeah, it's Thank great. You. It's so great. Uh, speaking of not so great though, uh, yeah. back into the drivers and the the actual excitement of monaco um sergio perez checo um i'm not gonna lie i was very surprised that he walked away from the crash the his car was not a car anymore (laughs) after after that crash it was three it was it was was three tires in a in a little squish try i and and the fact that we went from, oh, there's red, you know, oh, it's a red flag, and then camera cuts to this shot 
of the crunched the car, car and 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 of him standing outside of it putting his um steering wheel back on because that's the first thing we saw and then we saw the 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 actual like car itself and you're like oh that's and like they call the portion where the driver sit they call it the survival cell um and the survival cell does its damn job and it does its damn yeah. job really really well um and i can't believe he just walked out of that like no medical car, um, no no medical um, scooter. Um, he he walked back to the garage. Yeah, I I don't. Uh, it it was super scary to watch. Or I hate watching the crashes over and over on on the broadcast. Yeah, it's um, not my favorite. But Hulk, K Mags, and Checo were all out before the first stop was over, and it was caused by K Mags. It was labeled a racing incident. Um, so he won't get points on his license, so he won't be suspended. Which goes um, back to my point that they're never going to give a driver suspended. enough points to for for a race ban. Um, but yeah, it was it was ugly. Haas just had a disaster weekend overall, and I think I implied that Haas could have a really good weekend um, with you know the way they qualify. So maybe I jinxed them wholeheartedly. My bad. Um, but. I wanted to talk a little bit about what led to the Haas drivers being disqualified from qualifying um, because that was a little bit messy. Yeah, I think, honestly, I think Haas is just kind of throwing things together this season. They have a new team principal trying to get things going. It's not the car that was under his guidance. Like, I think we're just... I personally have lost a little confidence in Haas. It just seems yeah. like there's always something going on and, you know, I don't know. I just, I feel like last season they kind of had a little bit of momentum. They were doing really well in qualifying. This year, again, they're still doing well in qualifying, but they can't just quite piece it together. I feel like we're just always missing something with Haas. So, Yeah, and so what was interesting to me is, do you remember – and I'm sure you do, the drama between Lewis Hamilton and Max Verstappen in Brazil when Max touched the the rear wing of Lewis's car. Yes. Um, so that led to Lewis Hamilton losing pole position because it turned out that the amount of space in the rear wing where it opens um, to give you DRS, it was too big for um, the current regulations of 85 millimeters. Um, and they, I, they, if you Google Lewis Hamilton, Brazil rear wing 2021, you will get all the, all the content on it and all the explainers uh, of that and how they test for it. But basically that what happened to Lewis is what happened to the Haas cars. And I guess there was like a, a miscommunication with the design team and the mechanics when they brought this new rear wing that is, um, that was specifically for Monaco to, you know, maximize the amount of downforce that they need. And when it was set up, it was set up with the opening outside of that 85 millimeter limit. Um, and so Therefore, in that technical regulation, the drivers were penalized by being disqualified, um, but it was also determined that they weren't getting a tactical advantage from it, which is why they they started from the back of the grid and not um, in the pit lane. Um, but I, when I was looking into it, I was like, this sounds familiar. And I was like, oh, this was that Brazil. one time that this was, this was Brazil when Max um, was charged, you know, 25,000 euros for touching Lewis's car. Oops. Oops. Yeah. Um, I love how they weren't given a tactical advantage with this new updated wing. And yeah. so they, but anywho. It is what um, it is. So someone else who like didn't have a great weekend. Hmm. Um, <laughs> I would say all of Alpine, but sadly Gasly got a point. So I can't say all of them because a point for Alpine this season is a really big deal. Yeah. Um, but his his teammate Esteban Ocon, um, man, I would hate to be him right now. Yeah. Yeah, he, he, he had uh, a rough day. He went flying a la Fernando Alonso in Cota 2022, except he wasn't able to finish the race. Um, and then he was given a 10-second penalty after he was already out of the car and wearing his jeans and going to the media pen. Um, and everybody was expecting that 
um, 10 second penalty to be converted into a three place grid penalty, um, which, right, which is, that's why Sergio Perez um, double DNF'd in, in Suzuka last year because he had a penalty. He went back out so he could serve the penalty so that it didn't turn into a grid uh, drop for the for the following race. Um, but, you know, Ocon was already way out of the car, um, but it was turned into a five-place grid drop instead of a three-place, which I thought was, I don't know about excessive, but it was more than than anyone expected. I'm just so impressed that you managed to bring up the double DNF in an episode unprompted by me. You're welcome. Hey, um, <laughs> anyways, so to get back to Esteban, um, yeah, and his team principal is, like, pissed. Oh, and, big mad. And Bruno's, like, a very calm, collected Frenchman, and, oh God, I'm turning into the Sky Sports commentary calling people by their nationality, um, <laughs> but Bruno is, like, very calm and collected, and he went in on French TV and they had to like it wasn't in English it was in French and we had to get the translation but then they ended up telling you on the broadcast that it was like there's big consequences we're making new we're making big decisions right now like this will basically saying this isn't going to be swept under the rug and Ahan is going to like you know get every repercussion um yeah. Starting yeah, with really the most awkward. awkward social media post of all time after oh the race. God, well, we can all say, Akon did not post this. This was not his words. Someone gave him this, Those room, you know, this PR piece. So, um, yeah, there's, I just feel like the Alpine garage this season, there's just so much disconnect and everyone hates each other and no one wants to be there. Yeah. And it, it's like, you know, we, we talked earlier in this episode about how, um, Lando and Carlos were playing the ultimate team game to protect everyone's positions and, you know, Carlos right. protect, you know, not wanting anything bad to happen to, to Charles and, and, you know, things like that. And then you have Alpine, where I don't know if Akon and Gasly know what it means to play the team game. Um, and they just, they keep, keep going at each other every time they're anywhere near each other on the grid. It's like they they just gravitate toward each other and then beat the crap out of each other, but not in the same way that like Fernando and Esteban were um, in 2022 when they were still teammates. Um, and it's just, it's that really then speaks to the Alpine environment rather than an issue with, with the drivers itself. I, I, yeah. I really think. I, I mean, I it's know. a little bit of both. Alcon seems to be the common denominator for yes. every teammate. Um, however, how he's managed and handled, that's on the team. So yeah. I know that there's been changes at Alpine, um, and they've changed like their whole structure 27 times and changed yeah. titles of everybody. Um, but it's just interesting to see how the team is managing because like, he was a problem with um, Fernando. Now he's a problem with Gasly. I, I think he was a problem when he was when he was right. teammates with um with Perez because they 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 raced together for, for. I think Esteban may have really shot himself in the foot just showing that he can't play along because I think yeah. like Gasly's made an effort, and everything this season we've mentioned has been because of Ocon. Yeah, it 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 hasn't been good, and and the other problem for both like. There, the rumors have been swirling about like, do does one driver or both of these drivers want to leave Alpine? Um, and at this point, I personally think that it's both of them want to leave. Um, I don't think Gasly's getting what he expected when he left Alpha Tauri, and I just think that Akon is, you know, looking for for something different. Um, but the other the issue is is that unlike most other teams, um, they have two viable driver options as re replacements and viable you can say in quotes or not but they do have jack Dewan, who is their reserve driver and development driver um who is you know he he i think that he could he couldn't do worse in this bad car and then mick schumacher who i also don't think could do much worse in this bad car um so i think that that's another you know even more questions yeah i mean do I think that Akon's going to be taken out of the car for Canada? No. Oh, no. But do I think this really jeopardizes his seat for next season? Yes. Absolutely. Yeah. So. Oh, I, I do not want to know what the consequences are. <laughs> like, 
hearing this interview just made me really nervous and scared for Akon. And I don't even like him and I'm concerned. Yeah. I I it's 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 not good, especially since this is the guy who finished P3 in Monaco last year. Yeah. Oops. Ooh, how um, mighty have fallen. Yeah. Speaking of Monaco and Monaco's past, um, we have been pretty adamant about, you know, Monaco should stay on the calendar and Monaco is worthy of staying on, on the modern F1 calendar. Does the 2024 Monaco Grand Prix change your mind at all about that? So this is such a great question. So glad that you brought this up. Um, personally, it does not change my mind. It's worth it. The qualifying session and the little bit of excitement that we get every single year is worth it for me. Also, it's such a historic race and the harbor is beautiful. It's a really cool track. It's very different. I I love it. I don't want it to leave. However, I could see where this is such a big race and it is like the one that ESPN here in the U.S. here in the U.S., um, here in, in the US, US. <laughs> they're, they're in the US, you know, really promotes because it is Monaco. And then you bring in and you draw in some new people because this one's on ABC in the US too. It's not just on ESPN. So it is on a bigger broadcast channel. Yeah. And, you know, you get more eyes and then they're like, this is boring. It's cars going around and nothing's happening. You know what I mean? So I can see how it's an issue to newer fans. Like my friend who I was talking about earlier, he was like, so what's the point? Like nothing's happening. And I was like, well, yes, but tune in next to the next race because it'll be more exciting. Please don't lose your interest. Um, so I think it's hard because it is such a big sell. It's Monaco. Lots of a lot of a lot more eyes are on it than any other race, I would think, maybe Vegas. But it is kind of boring. So you it's like a catch-22. I love it. I don't want it to leave, but I can see, I can see the completely valid argument of why it should be. Yeah, I I also think that it I, I think it should say I think that, you know, this the issue with this race was due to the fact that everybody had a pit stop on lap one third mm -hmm. um, so that, you know, la so laps three through 76 were boring as hell. And then you realized, oh, Charles Leclerc is actually going to win his home race. I got it to be exciting. Last year's Monaco Grand Prix was actually one of the more exciting weekends as a whole because we had one of the best qualifying sessions of the year and also had an exciting race. Um, yeah. Monaco just can't be a boring, dry race. And you need a little bit of that wet weather excitement to make it exciting. I almost cried when Ferrari asked Charles to drive even slower because I was so bored. Um, but I do think that this is not the best Monaco Grand Prix and not the most representative of the Monaco Grand Prix, but it should still stick around. Yeah. And I, I mean, it's hard to judge it based on 2024. We had a red yes. flag lap one everyone got a free pit stop and then everyone went to the end of the race that's super atypical I wouldn't say or like abnormal I would say that if we had normal pitting it probably would have been more exciting people exactly to undercut, pit stops going wrong but when you have a red flag there's only so much you can do now right I will also say Australia we had like what 27 red flags one year and that was like absolutely madness we obviously don't want that because that's horrible when we have red flags, but when red flags are involved, it's so out of your hands and it should not be part of the argument of like, should we stay or not? Yeah, it, exactly. And it's not like, you know, this is the only track where, you know, you would be at risk of, of you know, having to manage tires for 74 laps. Like that's, yeah. you know, that's not always going to you know that's not always going to be the case in monaco and you can have that situation on another track um and the benefit of these other tracks is it's going to be easier to overtake unless we're thinking like we could have had the same issue at imola too um right and and i was just gonna say like have we outgrown monaco no have we outgrown imola i yes. think so yeah so yeah again but if imola had like a really amazing backdrop and all of the history and a little Maybe better TV direction and and but also the track is just meh like the track yeah. at Monaco is really cool so I don't know we'll yeah see. so so the answer is no this didn't ruin it for us and Christian Horner the team principal at Red Bull he actually made a good point of like you know Formula One has evolved the Monaco Grand Prix 
can, you know, also find ways to evolve to make it a little bit more exciting. I don't know necessarily what those things could be to make those changes. I think Fernando threw out um, the idea of changing qualifying to like the F2, F3 qualifying to see if that makes things better. Um, But I, I think that, you know, we can modify Monaco a little bit to make it, you know, a little bit more conducive to modern Formula One without having to go straight to let's like knock it off the calendar because it's old and the cars are too big. Yeah, but I don't know. I think, I think modifying it to fit into this perfect box of what like we want F1 to be is also stupid. Like I love how it is. I love the tradition of it. And I think, you know, holding one storied race where it doesn't fit into this tight, confined mass entertainment box, I think that's fine. I also think that the entire weekend is made by qualifying. Every single person knows that qualifying for Monaco is almost bigger than the race because that sets pretty much who's going to win. Um, And so I always look forward to qualifying in Monaco. I think it's the best qualifying session that we have all year round. And I think just for that, it I'm fine with Monaco staying. Yeah, no, I, you know, you, you can make a case for it and you can make a case for, like you said, and I, I have also said that, you know, maybe you have one weekend of the year that it isn't, you know, the pretty perfect traditional, you know, mass overtakes, whatever. And it's really goes down to strategy. And part of the strategy was tire management for 50 right. laps. And that's, you know, call it a problem with formula one itself rather than calling it a problem with Monaco. Yeah. hundred percent. Yeah. All right. Let's wrap let's not get up. predictions real quick. Let's wrap this up. So our predictions for Monaco <laughs> were just we were slaughtered. Um, yeah. So for poll, you had Oscar. I had Max. I was Lol. close. Yeah. Um, well. <sighs> yeah, you were. Uh, it was Charles. Good for him. He started on yeah. poll and he won. The podium was Charles, Oscar, Carlos. You and I both had Oscar. Um, I had Oscar in the right place. I know, I know. You had Max, Oscar, Lando. I had Max, Lando, Oscar. Um, Really, you know, doubling down on the McLaren upgrades. So McLaren looked really well. I have to say they did look really well. But I'm glad that it was a double podium for Ferrari. Um, And again, like we mentioned earlier, Gasly got P10. He got a point for Alpine. Um, I was close. I had Fernando. He wasn't too far off. Um, K-Mags, unfortunately, didn't finish the last (laughs) No, he did not. Again, we make these predictions super, super early. We make them on Wednesday. So we have no idea how things are going for the weekend. If there are upgrades that come to races, we don't know how they turn out. Um, This is going in blind, and that's what makes it so fun and so chaotic. Yeah, our our P10 picks are really, like, based off vibes more than anything else. Shot in the dark. Shooting fish in a barrel. Um, Okay, so for biggest surprise, you said that it's going to be an exciting Grand Prix and it's not going to be a parade. And it was absolutely (laughs) not. It was a parade for Charles, the only Monegasque driver. Yeah. It's such a fun word to say. And then I said that it was going to be a mixed grid. I feel like I get half a point here, at least, because it wasn't our typical grid. We had McLaren at the top. Red Bull was, like, Checo ended up, what, P15, P16? 18. No, for after qualifying. 18. Wait, he He moved up to, yeah. He he moved up to, he moved up when the, um, what's it, when the Haas were disqualified. This goes to show how much I really don't care about Checo. Um, I knew that, I knew that Sargent outqualified him, but I thought, like, it was, oh, wow, that's so bad. Okay. Yeah. So I feel like I deserve some points on that one. Yeah. And then who's going to do a dumb? You said that someone's going to bin it hard in the middle of Q2. Nope. No. Someone binned it hard on lap one, though. Yes. Um, and I just said Ferrari in general. And unfortunately, or fortunately, they had a good weekend. So. Well, I think fortunately because Carlos – was back to being team strategist Carlos Sainz. Like, you know, we haven't really heard the way that he was, you know, talking on the radio and, and, you know, just directing things. We haven't heard that in a while. And then you had, you know, chiefs, he put his chief strategist hat back on. um, And so they did not screw it up. No. But, you know, they'll find a way to do it another weekend. We'll see. 
Um, but yeah, so overall, I thought it was great. Very happy for a double Ferrari finish on the podium. Also, they're getting not super close, but kind of close to Red Bull. Yeah. I, I like, don't... What, 25 points behind or something like that now? Yeah, constructors-wise, they're very close because because Checo hasn't been scoring points lately. Um, okay. But I, I think... I, I said this after, after Imola. I don't really necessarily know how any of the cars are going to look on the grid um, just purely based on their performances in Imola and in Monaco. And I really think that Canada coming up is going to be our best understanding of where the cars stand all of the cars stand right now and it does red bull actually have problems or is this these were two tough tracks um is you know mclaren really good or has has they been getting lucky is ferrari being ferrari you know or are they actually back on an upswing so i think that canada will be a really indicative race and you know monaco is is always wonderful but this race was boring as hell well each their own yeah so to get a little not technical but explain canada is more of a tra- uh one of these newer bigger f1 tracks there's more room to pass and overtake imola is pretty narrow monaco's super narrow so there's not a yeah. lot of movement within the grid um so i think after miami we had two races where it was a little harder to navigate harder to make up places from qualifying if you didn't qualify well and not a lot of action, which is why the past two races have been a little boring um, for the most part. Canada gets us back to what we're more used to in modern day of wider tracks for the bigger cars, more overtaking, more excitement. So I think, you know, I definitely agree with you that this will be a really telltale of, of where the cars stack up. Yeah, exactly. But Speaking of Canada, we're going to Canada. Yay! (laughs) Not not actually, but the the traveling circus next stop is Canada. And we actually don't have a race this coming weekend, but it's in another week. So not this week, but next week, we will have our Canada predictions episode for you guys to listen to before the Grand Prix. So yay! But that is it for our Monaco Grand Prix recap. Thanks for going off track with us, guys.